أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم رأيتهم لي ساجدين قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا إن الشيطان للإنسان عدو بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد I welcome you all to the first of a series of حلقات that we will have about the tafsir or the explanation of one of the most interesting, one of the most powerful, one of the most moving surahs in the entire Qur'an, and it is the Surah Yusuf, the Surah of Yusuf alayhi salam. This Surah, Surah Yusuf, is a very, very unique Surah in the Qur'an. It is a one of a type of Surah. Firstly, it is the only place in the Qur'an where the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam is mentioned. There is no other surah that mentions the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Now if you compare this to let's say the story of the Prophet Musa. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam, his story is mentioned in over 25 different locations. The story of our father Adam. The story of Adam alayhi salam is mentioned in over half a dozen locations, right? The story of Isa, almost a dozen times. But the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, it only exists in this surah. In fact, even the name of the Prophet Yusuf, it only occurs once or twice in passing, just in passing. Surah An'am mentions the name of Yusuf. Surah Ghafil mentions just the name of Yusuf. But there's no story at all. So the stories about what happened with Yusuf alayhi salam, it only occurs in this particular surah. Secondly, it is the only surah in the Quran that has a unified story as its theme from the beginning to the end. The whole surah is nothing but a story. And there is no other surah of length in the Qur'an. We're not talking about the small surahs at the end of, of Juz Amma. We're talking about any surah, uh, basically more than 10 ayat, 15 ayat. There is no surah in the whole Qur'an that is a unified story from the beginning to the end. And this is something we all know. That read Surah Baqarah, read Surah Ali Imran, read Surah Yunus. You will mention and find the stories of lots of people. One paragraph, one page, sometimes even five pages. But there is no place in the whole Qur'an where an entire 15 pages is dedicated to one story. So it's a chronological story from the beginning to the end. And this is not just very rare, it's unique. There's no other place like it in the whole Qur'an. Now this story, this surah, it was revealed 
We don't know the exact date, but we know roughly around 10 or 11, uh, not of the Hijrah, but of the years of the Da'wah. In other words, the Hijrah, of course, we begin the Medinan phase. Before the Hijrah, what do we call it? Some scholars use the term BH, before Hijrah, right? Just like the Christians have AD and, and, and BC, uh, so Muslims have AH and BH, right? So if you look at BH, so 1BH means one year before the Hijrah. 2BH, two years before the Hijrah. So the Yusuf is revealed around 2 or 3BH. In other words, right at the end of the Meccan era, the Meccan message. Now, the timing of revelation is very crucial here. Surah Yusuf was revealed after the famous year called year, the year of sorrow, the year of regret, the year of difficulty, Am al huzn In this year, three things happened, one after the other, which were the most painful for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there was no time in the seerah where the Prophet sallallahu was more demoralized, if you like, than this period. And that is why the scholars of seerah call this era, this period, they call it Am al huzn the year of grief. He was sorry, and he was feeling grief throughout that year. What happened and what makes it worse, one after the other, these three things happened. The first of these three devastating things was the most personal and the most intimate, and that was the death of Khadija alayhi salam. Khadija alayhi salam was his supporter. Khadija alayhi salam was his moral, uh, if you like, uh, source of strength. And as they say, behind every great man there is a great woman. This is exactly applying to the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija. That Khadija was his source of comfort and support whenever anything happened. Even when the wahi came down and he was scared, what did he do? He went running back to Khadija ﷺ to be calmed down. Zammiluni, zammiluni, cover me up, cover me up. So Khadija was his source of comfort, his source of support. And when a man has that comfort inside the house, when he has that love, he is able to face a lot outside. And when that is deprived of him, then the problems outside become more difficult to bear. So the death of Khadija was something that was very difficult for him. Within five, six weeks, a second death followed. And that was the death of his uncle, Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was his support in society. Abu Talib was the one who sacrificed his own reputation, his own prestige, in order to protect the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib was the one when the Quraysh came to bribe him, the Quraysh came to threaten him, the Quraysh came to intimidate him. And initially he was scared. Initially he, he, he went to the Prophet ﷺ, do something, stop doing this. You all know the famous story. The Prophet ﷺ said, if they were to give me control of the sun and moon, I wouldn't give up what I'm doing. So Abu Talib said, O oh son of my brother, O oh my nephew, do as you please. I'm never going to come to you again to tell you not to do this. And he was a man of his word for 10 years. Not once did he approach the Prophet ﷺ after that. After this incident of the sun and moon, when he said, if they were to give me this, I would not give up. Not once did Abu Talib ever come and say, why did you do this? Look what now, what, what do I have to face now? You know, look now I have to tell my, my cousins, my relatives, what you have, not once. He was a man of his word. And Abu Talib did everything he could. So much so that when the Quraysh boycotted the Prophet ﷺ, and they said, you must leave Mecca. And he went with the Muslims and with Bilal and with all of them to live in the valleys outside of Mecca. Abu Talib was not a subject of that boycott because he's a pagan, he's a Qurashi, he's a, he's a mushrik. Abu Talib was not a part of the boycott. But because he was a part of his nephew, he loved him so much, he voluntarily, he was the only non-Muslim to live with the Muslims at the time of boycott. The only non-Muslim who voluntarily gave up his privileges, his house in Mecca. He gave up everything and he suffered along with the Muslims because he felt this is injustice. And he felt I have to do this as the uncle, as the protector and he did everything he could. And as long as Abu Talib was alive, they could not do anything else to harm the Prophet ﷺ. With his death, that was when the persecution reached its max and that's why eventually he had to leave to Medina because he couldn't live in Mecca anymore. So Khadija was his internal support in the house and Abu Talib was his external support in society. The both of them, one after the other, they died. And this was a very difficult time for our Prophet ﷺ to make matters worse. He suffered the single most uh, if you like, depressing or most difficult day of his whole life after the deaths of Khadija and Abu Talib, as if there could be no law, there was one law after that. And that was the incident of Ta'if. The incident of Ta'if. Aisha radiallahu anha said, O Messenger of Allah, was there any day that was more difficult for you to bear than the day of Uhud? Was there anything that was more difficult than Uhud? He said, yes. 
Aisha was too young to know anything about Mecca. Aisha doesn't remember Mecca. So she knows Badr, she knows Uhud, she knows Tabuk, she knows it. So she knows the problems of Medina. So she knows the worst problem of Medina was what? Was Uhud. So she asked, was there any day that was more difficult to you than Uhud? Immediately, without thinking, without, he knows what's his most difficult day. He said, yes, the most difficult day for me was the day when I was rejected by the brothers of Abdi Ali, meaning the chieftains of Ta'if. And you all know the story, and we'll talk about it in a lot of detail, inshallah, in our other lectures that we'll start about the seerah, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ was humiliated, and he was publicly uh, scorned, and the children of Ta'if uh, went uh, stoning him. This day was the most difficult for him. Now these three incidents, they occurred within six weeks of one another, within two months, one after the other, as if things could not get any, any, any worse, basically. At this point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Yusuf. And when we understand this frame of revelation, all of a sudden the significance of Surah Yusuf increases many times. Why? Surah Yusuf is meant to uplift his spirit, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's meant to console him. It's meant to strengthen him. At a time of such trial, tribulation, Surah Yusuf is going to be his light that will lead him out of this depression. Of this, when I say depression, of obviously the Prophet is not suffering from depression, but we mean it's a depressing time. It's a time of pain. It's a time of anguish. And this is hope for us. When we are feeling down, when we are suffering from problems of society, this is the surah we can turn to, to get an uplifting moment, to get some solace and comfort. That's why Allah revealed it to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Scholars also mention that uh, a, number of, a number of incidents happened that also led to the revelation of this surah. Of these incidents is, as the persecution of the Muslims increased, and the Sahaba in Mecca were feeling more and more overwhelmed by all of the pressures. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu and they said, O Messenger of Allah, why don't you tell us the stories of those before who also suffered? Why don't you tell us what happened? Uh, give us some qasas, give us some stories of the people before. And so when they wanted these stories, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, again, perfect timing, when the persecution reaches its maximum, and that is why the hijrah occurs two years after this surah, right? Two years after the surah, the hijrah occurs. Because you cannot live in Mecca anymore. They will literally, it reached, as you know, the night before the hijrah, they were going to kill him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They, they, put, they sent out an assassination squad, surrounded his house, 50 people. That's it, end of story, right? Had it been anything other than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is the end of Islamic history. But Allah miraculously saved him. So, one of the direct causes of revelation was the fact that the Sahaba wanted something to uplift their spirits as well. Another direct cause of revelation, it is said that the Quraysh, they wanted to try to outwit the Prophet ﷺ and wanted to show that he's not truly a Prophet. And so they sent a delegation to Yathrib, to the Yahud of Yathrib. And they asked the Yahud of Yathrib, Yathrib of course is the name of Medina before it is Medina. They asked the Yahud of Yathrib, tell us a question that only a prophet would be able to answer. Give us a trick question that we can show once and for all that this man is not a prophet. Tell us a question you know the answer to, but nobody else knows. Now, even though the Yahud were a different religion than the Quraysh, the Quraysh felt that the Yahud were superior because of their book. The Quraysh did not have a holy book, right? The Quraysh did not have a scripture. The Quraysh did not have a revelation. And the Yahud had a revelation. So the Quraysh felt this, this sense of inferiority. That you Yahud are the people of the book and you know knowledge we don't know. And you believe in prophets, we don't, we don't know any prophets amongst us. So you tell us something. So they went to the, the Yahud and the Yahud said, ask him about the story of Yusuf and his brothers. Nobody knows this. And by the way, this is an interesting point. We're going to come to this uh, again. In Mecca, there were no Christians and Jews. In Mecca, there were only idol worshippers, idolaters, pagans. There were no centers of Christianity and Judaism. There were one or two private converts, as we know. Uh, the Waraqa uh, ibn Nawfal and others, these are private converts, secret. They convert to Christianity, but they're not, uh, they're not inviting others to it. They're not preaching Christianity. There's no libraries of, 
of, of Christian theology, of Jewish theology. So nobody in Mecca knew these stories. The people in Mecca have not heard of Yusuf. Why? Yusuf is not their ancestor, right? The people of Mecca are descendants of Ismail, not of Ishaq. The tribes of, of, Israel, of, of Israel have nothing to do with the Meccans, the people of Quraysh. They don't know these stories. And so the, the, the Yahud knew this. And they said, go ask him if he truly is a prophet to tell you what happened with Yusuf and his brothers. Because nobody knows this of your people. This is something we know. And they were far away. They were in Yathrib. How would anybody in Mecca know this? So they went to the Prophet wasallam and they asked him, tell us the story of Yusuf and his brothers if you are truly a prophet. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that question and he reveals Surah Yusuf and right at the end of the surah, one of the last verses in the surah, Allah says that ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الْغَيْبِ نُوحِيهَا إِلَيْكَ This is of the ilm al-ghayb that we send down to you. You didn't know this, you and your people before, you didn't know this. So in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is telling the Prophet that that we're, we're giving you ilm al-ghayb. You did not know this story before uh, this surah came down to you. This surah begins with the letters Alif Lam Ra. And I have recited the first uh, five or six ayat of this surah. Alif Lam Ra. We all know that there are a number of surahs in the Quran that begin with letters. Alif Lam Mim, Ha Mim, Ayn Sin, Qaf, Noon, Qaf, Kaf, Ha Ya, Ayn Sad, Ta Ha Ya Sin. All of these, they begin with letters. These letters are called Al Muqatta'at, Huruf Al Muqatta'at, the broken letters. That's what the scholars of tafsir call these letters. Why do they call them broken letters? Because they don't form words. Hamim is not a word. Alif Lam Mim is not a word, right? So they don't form words. So the scholars of tafsir call them Huruf Al Muqatta'at. Broken letters put together. And these huruf al-muqatta'at, scholars have wondered about their meanings since the very beginning of time. Since the time of the tabi'un, taba tabi'un, they began wondering, what do these letters mean? What is it, alif lam mim, in the beginning of the Qur'an? What is ha mim, ayn sin qaf, noon, kaf, haya, ayn sar? There are over 15 opinions about what these letters represent. Some of the opinions are that they represent Names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Alif is for Allah, Lam is for Al-Latif, uh, Mim is for al muhaymin let's say. So they have different opinions, but this doesn't seem to have uh, a strong basis of it. Uh, one opinion is that we will never know what these, what these, uh, what these huruf al-muqatta'at mean. Now this is a valid opinion insofar as that, yes, we will never know for sure. Only Allah knows for sure. But we can try to think and try to come forth with some type of opinion. Why? Because why did Allah reveal these, these letters? There must be a wisdom. So we can try to think of wisdoms of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these letters in the beginning of these surahs. One thing that we notice, which is very interesting, almost all the time in the Qur'an, any time Allah begins a surah with these letters, the very next phrase has something to do with the Qur'an. Think all of the surahs you know. Yasin, well, Quran al Hakim, right? Kaf ha ya ain sad, dhikru rahmati rabbika, dhikru rahmati. This is what I'm telling you in the book, right? Alif lam mim, dhalik al kitabu, la rayba fi, right? In this, Alif lam ra, tilka ayatul kitab al mubin, right? Hamim, well, kitab al mubin. So if you look at almost every, now there are some exceptions where it's not the second verse, but it's the third or fourth verse. But in every single time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions huruf al muqattaat within those few verses, something to do with the Qur'an is mentioned. So it would make sense that the huruf al muqattaat have something to do with this magnificent Qur'an. Every time the Qur'an is praised after huruf al muqattaat So there's got to be, or there should be, one would say, it's logical to make some connection. So what is this connection? Scholars have tried to think about this and they've compiled all of these huruf al muqatta'at And these huruf al muqatta'at they number exactly 14 letters. Exactly 14. If you compile all of the letters that are present in these huruf, right? Alif, Lam, Mim, Ha, Mim, Ta, Ha, Noon, Yasin. You put them all together, you get exactly 14. How many letters are in the Arabic alphabet? 28. There are 28 letters in the Arabic alphabet. So, 14 is obviously exactly half of 28, okay? So some scholars have read in some type of symbolic meaning here. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that the Qur'an is composed of our letters. The Qur'an is composed of the language that we speak. And yet, mankind cannot produce something similar to it. It is as if Allah is taunting the rejecters of the Qur'an by showing them, these are your words, these are your letters. Now produce a simil surah similar to it if you're able to do so. Produce a Qur'an similar to it. Produce ten surahs similar to it. You all know there are verses in the Qur'an that are called the verses of challenge. Ayatul Tahaddi. Exactly there are five verses that challenge. In one of these verses Allah says bring a whole Qur'an. In another verse Allah says bring ten surahs. In another verse Allah says bring something. In, another, in two verses Allah says bring one surah. One surah if you can. So, sorry, no one, one surah. One surah. So, uh, in these verses of challenge, in these verses of challenging, it is as if there is a linkage with the huruf al muqatta'at and these verses of challenge. It is as if Allah is saying, here is half of the alphabet, bring the other half and bring something similar to the Qur'an. So, one of the wisdoms that scholars have tried to derive from the huruf al muqatta'at is to show the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. That the Qur'an is composed of words that we speak, language that we know, letters that we write, and yet mankind is not able to produce something similar to this. And Allah knows best, we will never know for sure what are the meaning of the huruf al muqatta'at but it does appear that there is some relationship with the beauty and the majesty and the uh, miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin And by the way, for those of you who want to come regularly, inshallah, all of you, it will be good if you bring your mushafs as well and follow along because we're going to be doing a tafsir and when we do a tafsir what this means is we will look at every word, every context and if you have your copy of the Qur'an then you can follow along uh, if you want to write some notes as well this would be also inshallah beneficial Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin Tilka is an Arabic word which means these, this, these but there is a difference between Tilka and Hadihi they both mean this Tilka and Hadihi means this or these, but there's a difference. Hadihi, we use it for something close. Hadihi over here. Tilka, we use it for something far away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the Quran in the far away tense. Not, it's not a tense, but it's a, a word. And He does this not only here, but also in Surah Baqarah. Alif Lam Mim, Thalik al Kitab. Thalik is for far away. Kitab is masculine, so we say thalik, right? Tilka ayat is feminine, so we say tilka. So feminine and masculine aside, there is a difference between hadha, hadhihi versus tilka and thalika, right? So hadha kitab over here, right? You say hadha kitab. But to, to point to something far away, you say tilka. Tilka al kitab, over there, far away, not this one. So Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the Quran in the uh, pronoun, if you like, that talks about something far away. Why does Allah mention the far away pronoun when the Qur'an is in our hands? To show that the status of the Qur'an is exalted. To show that the Qur'an is worthy of being something that is majestic. Even if you have it, we should thank Allah that we have it, but its status is a high status. It is a status that is a noble status. So Allah says, Tilka ayatu al-kitabi al mubin These are the ayat. These are the verses of the Kitab al-Mubin, which is the clear book or the, uh, or the lucid book. Now, ayat, we all know what it means. An ayah is a part of the surah. An ayah is a section. We call it in English a verse. An ayah is a verse. And this shows us that Allah Azza wa Jal Himself has divided the Qur'an into ayat. Where does this division come from? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How about into surahs? Allah Azza wa Jal also says, وَإِذَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ When a surah comes down, right? هَذِهِ سُورَةٌ Allah says, this is a surah. سُورَةٌ أَنزَلْنَاهَا This is a surah, we, we, we reveal it. So Allah mentions the word surah and the word ayah. Why do we care about this? Well, because many other scriptures, including many of the New Testament scriptures, if you look at them, those divisions are man-made. Not just the divisions, the texts are man-made, right? For us, the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even the divisions within the Qur'an. By divisions, I mean surah and ayat. They come from Allah. Surah and ayat, they come from Allah. So Allah says, these are the ayat of the clear book. Tilka ayatul kitab al-mubin. Now, ayah, 
we all know an ayah means a verse, but an ayah also means a sign, an indication. An ayah also means a miracle. And a verse is a sign and a verse is a miracle. So Allah uses the term that is loaded with meaning. What does ayah mean? Allah calls the miracles of creation ayah. Allah says, in your creation there is an ayah. Allah says, in the sun and the moon there is an ayah. And Allah calls the verses of the Qur'an an ayah. It's not a coincidence. Allah knows what He is saying. And no one is more eloquent than Allah. The meaning here, every verse of the Qur'an, there is a message for you. Every verse of the Qur'an, there is an indication. Every verse of the Qur'an, there is a miracle. Tilka ayat. Al-Kitab al-Mubin. These are the ayat of the clear book. Mubin is a description of the book. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal calls the Qur'an many different names. But there are two names that are the most common. Kitab and Qur'an. Tilka ayatul Kitab al-Mubin. This is the verses of the clear book. Kitab and Qur'an, they occur both around 75 times to describe our book. The Qur'an is called Qur'an and the Qur'an is called Kitab. There is no other description that is more common than Kitab and Qur'an. Kitab and Qur'an are complementary to each other. Kitab and Qur'an put together tell us what this book is. What does Kitab mean? Something that is written down. What does Qur'an mean? Something that is recited. So the Qur'an is something that is written down and it is recited simultaneously. No other book from Allah has been preserved to this level. The Qur'an has been written down by the commandment of Allah and the Qur'an has also been recited by Allah, by Jibreel, by the Prophet and it is recited to this day. And this is of the miracles of the Qur'an that no other book has. All the other books, they were written down by men. They were written down by uh, by, by uh, the scribes, by people after the times of the prophets. But as for us, the kitab and the Quran are complementary. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin What does al-mubin mean? Al-mubin can have two meanings to it. The first meaning is the book itself is a clear book. As Allah says in the beginning of Baqarah, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه. There's no doubt in it. There's no ambiguity in it. The book is clear. And what does it mean the book is clear? It means anybody who approaches the Qur'an will be able to get some message from it. Anybody who approaches the Qur'an can find some level of benefit from it. And what this means is that the Qur'an is a book that is meant to be contemplated by every single Muslim. It's not something that only the elite have access to. It's not something that only the, the scholars should read. Even the basic average Muslim can benefit from the Qur'an. Now no doubt, the average Muslim can only benefit a certain level. And the more they grow in knowledge, the more they can benefit. This is a common misconception that Alhamdulillah is getting more and more minimal these days. But once upon a time it's very common to hear, Oh, anybody can interpret the Qur'an. I can open up the Qur'an and interpret it. No, interpretation requires knowledge. But simple hidayah, you can get it immediately from the Qur'an. You can even get it via a translation. You can read the Qur'an for personal benefit. You can read the Qur'an for personal guidance. Anybody can do so. There are levels of meaning. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ الحمد لله رب العالمين. You understand it. Now if you want to go deep and dissect, why did Allah say hamd and not shukr? Why did Allah say this? And now you need ilm. You need, you need knowledge. But the average Muslim can benefit from the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is mubin. Another meaning of Allah calling the kitab mubin, Allah saying this is a mubin book. What does Mubin mean? Bayin, clear. Another uh, meaning of Allah calling the book clear, it means this book is a clear message from Allah. You don't have any doubt where it's from. So the Mubin doesn't refer to the language, it refers to the origin and the source of the book. The book has a clear cut source, everybody knows where this book is from. This book is no ambiguity in it. This book we know, it's not an ambiguous book. Now, this might surprise you, but to this day, nobody knows who wrote the New Testament. Nobody knows. Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, nobody knows who they were. To this day, nobody knows the biographies of these people. They were not the actual disciples of Christ. They're anonymous people living in the second or third century or the second, third generation after Jesus Christ. Nobody knows. To this day, nobody knows who wrote the Old Testament. Completely shrouded in, in mystery. 
the Jews believe that Musa wrote it, of course the Orthodox Jews, but no other group believes this because the Old Testament, it mentions the death of Musa, who buried Musa, it mentions everything after Musa. Uh, people don't know who wrote it. Allah is saying this is a Mubin book. You know the origin, you know the source, everything is clear about it. There's no question mark. And I cannot stress for you, O Muslims, that we take this for granted. We take it for granted as if it's something that is no big deal. There is no other religious scripture on the face of this earth that is as unambiguous, as clear, as demarcated from Fatiha to Nas in the origin of language, exactly the same as the Quran. You look at the Hindu scriptures, you look at the Buddhist scriptures, you look at the Christian, you look at the Jewish scriptures, there is such a massive confusion. In many religions, you don't even know what the scripture is. In almost all religions, the language is not the language spoken by the prophets. The original New Testament was written in which language? Greek. Jesus Christ didn't speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic, right? And what I'm trying to stress to you, we take these things for granted. Our Quran, there's no versions. To this day, the Orthodox Christians have one Bible, the Protestants have another Bible, the Catholics have another Bible. Different books, completely. Different editions and subtractions. To this day, there are different versions. We, you can belong to any sect of Islam. This is amazing. You can differ in theology. There are other groups in Islam, but their Quran is exactly the same. From Fatiha to Nas, word for word, letter for letter, haraka for haraka, right? You purchase a Quran in India, you purchase it here, you purchase it in Timbuktu, you have handwritten manuscripts. Alhamdulillah, this is such a blessing from Allah that we just take for granted. That our holy book is clear. Tilka ayatul kitabin mubin. And all of this proves, as Allah says in the Quran, in a surah before this one, that we have revealed this scripture and we will protect it. Inna nahnu nazal dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. Another also way to understand this uh, is Tilka Atuk Mubin. Allah is saying this surah in particular is something that is clear for you. You need nothing else besides this surah. So this is an indication of the importance of the surah. And to emphasize this point, Allah says, Inna, the third verse, Inna anz or so the second verse, Inna anzannahu Quranan Arabiyan la'allakum ta'qidun. Inna anzannahu. We have sent this Quran down. We have sent it down as an Arabic Qur'an so that you may understand. إِنَّ أَنزَلْنَا قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ A question that many Muslims ask, why does Allah refer to Himself in the plural? In fact, even many non-Muslims ask, why does, why does God refer to Himself in the plural in the Qur'an? What is the we? There are two primary uh, interpretations of this. The first of them is that the we is a royal plural, the plural of majesty. The plural of Izzah. And this is something that is allowed in the Arabic language that a singular person, one man, will say we when he is worthy of it, meaning like king or royalty. And to this day, even in the English language, even in the English language, uh, the Queen of England, she never says I, she always says we. Even in the English language, the we here is the we of royalty. She doesn't mean we, meaning me and my family, she means I. But she says we to indicate that majesty. And in Arabic, this is also is called the royal plural. And so this is a, perm a permissible interpretation. Ibn Taymiyyah has another interpretation. Ibn Taymiyyah says that every time there is a plural in the Qur'an, this is a reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala along with the command of the angels. Allah tells the angels to do something. And that is why, and this is interesting, Ibn Taymiyyah says never in the Qur'an does Allah say, worship us. He always says, worship me. But Allah says, we reveal the book because the book comes down via Jibreel. Allah says, we send the rain because every single drop of rain has an angel taking it right to where Allah said it's going to go. Allah says, we are the ones who blow the winds because the angels are the ones who take the winds, right? Allah says, we are the ones who take the souls because the angel of death comes and takes the souls, right? So this is an interesting interpretation which also seems to make sense that when Allah says, we... He means, I am doing this and I'm telling the angels to execute this command. Because the Qur'an comes down at the command of Allah by the hands of Jibreel. If you like, Jibreel is the one who brings it down. So this is one interpretation as well and it has a good uh, basis to it. Anzalnahu. You all know what anzala means. Anzala means to descend. Nazala means to go down. Nazala means to descend. 
And this shows that the Quran physically came down. Physically. But we know that the Quran did not come down onto a mountain and the book was there. What does it mean? There are a number of meanings here. Firstly, that Jibreel came down with the recitation of the Quran. So literally the Quran is coming down with Jibreel in his memory. And Jibreel is reciting it to the Prophet wasallam. Secondly, we learn from a hadith in, uh, in Mustadrak of Al-Hakim that on Laylatul Qadr, Allah Azza wa Jal physically sent down a divine copy of the Quran. Physic, a book, a part of the Lawh al Mahfuz that had the Quran on it. You all know what Lawh al Mahfuz is. Allah says in the Quran, Bal huwa kitab Quran al Majidun fi Lawhim Mahfuz. Right? So there is a copy of the Quran in the Lawh al Mahfuz. And according to one hadith, which is authentic, on Laylatul Qadr, Allah says, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. And in one interpretation, this Lawh al Mahfuz portion of the Quran was literally sent down to the lowest heavens on Laylatul Qadr before the Wahi began. Before the Wahi began upon the Prophet, Allah sent down this copy of the Quran to the lower heavens. And Jibreel alayhi salam would take from there as well. So there is a physical descent of a divine copy of the Quran. And so Allah says, Anzala. And there's also a metaphysical descent, meaning within Jibreel. Jibreel brings the Quran down. And this also shows us of the many evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above. Some people say Allah is everywhere, but it doesn't make sense. Allah is not everywhere. This not what Allah Azza wa Jal is above us, and that's why the Quran is coming down. If Allah was not above us, then the Quran would not need to come down, nor would the Prophet have to go up in Isra wal Miraj to speak to him. So the Quran is coming down. Inna anzalnahu. We have sent down this Quran. Now sometimes Allah says we have anzala, and sometimes He says we have nazala. Anzala and nazala. What's the difference between these? Minor difference, but it's also very profound and deep. Anzala means to send down at once. Nazala means to send down bit by bit. And the Quran is referenced with Anzala and with Nazala. The Quran, sometimes Allah says Anzala, and sometimes He says Nazalna. Nazala. What is the difference again? Anzala means it comes down. It comes down like this. Nazala means, I cannot break this up, but we break it up into bits. One bit, another bit, another bit, another bit. That's Nazala. Right? Now, the Quran is sometimes Anzal and sometimes Nazal. How is this? Because both occurred. The Quran came down in its entirety on Laylatul Qadr. This is Anzala. And then for the next 23 years, what happened? Jibreel brought it 5, 10, 15, 20 ayat at a time. This is, what is this? Nazala. And so Allah Azza wa Jal speaks the exact truth, and both of these things are valid. Inna anzalnahu. Quran and Arabiya. We have revealed this as an Arabic Quran. Quran and Arabiya. Now, this is a very, very interesting verse. There are 11 verses in the Quran, exactly 11 verses, that characterize the Quran as being Arabic. Allah says in 11 verses that this is an Arabic Quran. We have revealed an Arabic Quran. This is in Bilisan in Arabiyyim Mubin. This is in clear Arabic language. And from this, there is unanimous consensus amongst all the scholars of Islam that the Qur'an can only be in Arabic. Because of this, because of a verse, just like this verse. Inna zana Qur'anan Arabiyya. So Allah describes the Qur'an as being an Arabic Qur'an. And what this means, when we read a translation, we are not reading the Qur'an. We all know this, but this is the evidence. What this means, when we stand up in salah, we cannot say, all praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. If we do so, our salah is null and void. We have to say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. If we were to recite it in a non-Arabic language, that is not Qur'an. It is a translation. It is not the actual Qur'an. And what this shows us as well, is that the Qur'an, the Qur'an, is, um, what it shows us as well is that the Qur'an has been 
revealed in the language that Allah Azza wa Jal spoke it. Now this is a deep theological point, I don't want to go too deep here, but Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah believe something which other groups deny. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they believe the Quran is the Kalamullah. You've all heard this, right? We call the Quran Kalamullah. Other groups, they deny this. Uh, other groups, they said, it's not Kalamullah. For Ahlul Sunnah, we believe the Quran is the Kalamullah. What does it mean, it's the Kalamullah? It means that, literally, Allah Azza wa Jal spoke the Quran. He recited the Quran. That's why we call it Kalamullah. And it means that Jibreel heard this recitation. And Jibreel brought this recitation down to the Prophet Sallallahu And the Prophet recited it after he heard it from Jibreel. And from Jibreel to the Prophet from the Prophet to the Sahaba, up until this day, we have a continuous chain, non-stop. And it is from Allah Azza wa Jal the recitation begins. It's from Allah Azza wa Jal. And what this means when Allah says we have revealed an Arabic Quran, that that recitation was done in Arabic as well. Because that's why it is an Arabic Quran. And you know, getting into, forget the theology, when we recite the Quran, what we feel is something that is divine. Even if you're not Arab, when you recite the Quran, you feel something. This is an amazing speech. It is a, it's a divine speech. Why, where did this come from? Well, when you understand Sunni theology, you understand why, where this came from. We believe that this recitation, it was recited by Allah Azza wa Jal. And therefore, when we recite it, there is something of divinity. Not my recitation is not divine, astaghfirullah. But there's something divine about the Qur'an. And that is why the Qur'an, it must be respected. You cannot put it on the floor, show disrespect to it. You, it's, it's sunnah to respect the Qur'an. You should put it on a high place in the room. You should have wudu when you touch it, right? You're not, you're not allowed to touch the Qur'an without wudu. So many aspects of respect, why? Because the Qur'an is not just any book. The Qur'an is Kalamullah. And when it is Kalamullah, it has a certain status that no other book has. So Allah says, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiya. We have revealed it in an Arabic Qur'an. Now, a question also arises here, does this mean that all of the words in the Qur'an are Arabic? When Allah says this is an Arabic Qur'an, does this mean every single word in the Qur'an is Arabic? There are clearly words in the Qur'an that come from, uh, from Persian, from Greek, uh, from even Roman. There are clearly words in the Qur'an that are not words that are pure Arabic. Istabraq. Abariq. These are Roman Persian words. Sometimes there's even Sanskrit words. There's even words from Greek, from sorry, from Latin. And those Latin words have also worked their way into English, by the way. It's an interesting point here. So there are some words that we, we are native speakers of English, right? Uh, and English, of course, is based in Latin. And Latin is a very ancient language. And some words from Latin made their way to the Arabs as well. Can anybody think of any word that is Quranic and English at the same time? There's more than one. That's a good attempt. Ard, he said Ard. It's a good attempt. Earth, Ard. Uh, it's a good... Sidr? Sugar. The Quran does not mention sugar. The Quran does not mention sugar. It's a good attempt, but the, it's not in the Quran. No, we're talking about English and Latin and, uh, and, and, and Quran. Uh, story. Story. Arabs. Asatir. Asatir. Right? Asatir. Asatir is not a pure Arabic word, it's a Latin word. Right? And the English word story is from the very Latin that made its way to the Arabs and we find in the Quran, these are Asatir. These are the stories of old. When you read Yusuf on any translation, how do they translate asatir? Story. It's the same word. There's other words as well uh, that have slightly been changed. Uh, the word justice. What is the Arabic for justice? How is it the same, Sheikh? We're trying to find the same word. Another word for justice. Qistas. Qistas. Wazinu bil qistas. Al Mustaqim, right? It's a similar, it's from the same root as the Latin root. So from English it entered and it became justice, from Arabic it became Qislas. And there are two or three other words like this, just as a side point, something for your benefit, uh, that there are 
some now the question arises now Allah says this is an Arabic Quran so the Sahaba Tabi'un Taba Tabi'un they read the Quran and they said hold on a sec not every single word is Arabic what do we do and so some of the early scholars and the most famous amongst them is Imam Shafi'i Imam Shafi'i said anybody who says that there's a single word of non-Arabic in the Quran he's a jahil he doesn't, know what, he doesn't know what he's talking about. How can there be a non-Arabic word in the Qur'an when Allah says, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiyya. So Imam al-Shafi'i, his love for the Qur'an was so much, he said, I don't care. I'm not going to listen to any argument. Allah says, Qur'anan Arabiyya, end of story. Every single word has to be Arabic. Ya yeah, Imam al-Shafi'i, what do we do with these words that are found in other languages? They took them from the Arabs. Now, with all respect, I love Imam al-Shafi, he's a great scholar, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite work, right? I mean, it doesn't work that way. So later scholars said, no, 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 there's lots of non-Arabic words in the Qur'an. Lots of non-Arabic words, not a problem. And some of them, Imam al-Suyuti wrote a book, and over 250 words in this book uh, are basically uh, claimed to be of non-Arabic, uh, that these are non-Arabic words. He said, this is a Farsi word, this is a, a Sundus is a Farsi word. There's a word in Sanskrit as well, it will come to me soon. Um, uh, basically, uh, ancient Urdu or Hindi is a word that's also in the Quran. So the, he, he brings all of these, there's words from Aramaic, uh, words from, uh, from uh, uh, Ethiopic, Istabraq. Uh, these are words from the Ethiopic language, they're not Arabic words. So how do we reconcile this? Uh, a great scholar by the name of Abu Ubaid al-Qasim ibn Salam, who died 230 or so Hijra. Abu Ubaid al-Qasim ibn Salam, he said, both groups are right. How can both groups be right? Imam al-Shafi'i is right and his opponents are right. How can both groups be right? This is what you call a little bit of thinking. Calm down, look at both sides, both groups are right. How so? He said, yes, Allah says, inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiya. This is one of their main evidences, this verse, right? That's why we're going into this tangent. For those of you who have never attended any of my lecture, I am guilty of going into... Lots of tangents. Unfortunately, my mind cannot think straight. So I'm trying to go here, but it goes here and there. Some of my students like this stuff, so alhamdulillah. And some of them get irritated. Uh, we'll, we'll, it, actually, I get more irritated than my students. But this is not a tangent. This is related to this verse. So excuse me this. This is not a tangent. Why? Because this is the main evidence. Inna anzalna Qur'anan Arabiya. This is what we're, verse we're talking about. So Abu Ubaid al-Qasim al he said, there is no contradiction. Both of you guys are right. How can both of you guys be right? He said, and this is, as I said, intelligence and aql. He said, every language interacts with other languages. And it incorporates words from the other language into its own. And substitutes the letters of those languages with the letters of its own. And changes the word to suit its own grammar. So, story becomes asatir, afail. Right? Story becomes asatir. Justice becomes qistas. They make it Arabic. And the word becomes a fluent Arabic word. So much so that when an Arab uses the word, nobody thinks of its Greek origin. Nobody thinks of its Latin origin. Nobody thinks of its Aramaic origin. It is an Arabic word even if it came 100 years ago, 200 years ago from another language. And you know, this is the way languages work. Anybody who studied even the basics of language, you, you bring in words from other cultures and then they become a part of your language. And so they are Arabic words, even if they were taken from non-Arabic languages, now they are Arabic words. So Allah has spoken the truth. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiya. Imam al-Shafi'i has said the truth that every word is Arabic, even though his interpretation was a little bit incorrect, but he is true. Every single word is an Arabic word. So that you may understand. You may understand what? Allah doesn't say you may understand what. So that you may understand dot 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 blank. You may understand what? It's not finished. The sentence is not complete. Why? It's because when you leave the sentence blank, you encompass all meanings. You don't need to fit. If you finish the sentence, you limit it. When you leave it blank, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So that you may understand everything. Everything. It doesn't need to be limited. And this also shows us that there is a reason why Allah chose the language of the Arabs and that is because His Prophet is an Arab Prophet. And it is because the people of this Prophet, His immediate people, 
are an Arab people. And this tells us very frankly that the Arabic language is the most eloquent language. And we as Muslims, and I say this as a non-Arab of ethnicity, and I have no problem saying this, and I would go even farther to say, and this is the opinion of Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, and Adi, many scholars, they said this very clearly, that, and, uh, and many of these scholars were also non-Arabs. They said the Arabic language is the best language. Even as non-Arabs, we must acknowledge this. Now, the Arabic of today is not that language. So, the Arabs amongst you, with all respect, we're talking about Fusha, we're talking about Quranic Arabic, right? That language, as for modern Arabic, it is a different language altogether, right? It's not the language of, uh, of, of, of that uh, era. We're talking about that language. That language is the most eloquent language. We must believe this as a part of Aqidah. Imam Shafi'i said, this is our Aqidah. And Imam Ma some of the scholars are very strict. Imam Malik, if anybody spoke Farisi, now in those days there was only one more language that the Muslims spoke. It was Farisi. There's only one language, it's classical Farsi. If anybody spoke Farsi in front of Imam Malik, you would have him kicked out of the Prophet's Masjid because he was the Imam of the Masjid. Anybody spoke Farsi, he goes, get out of here. This is, this is a place where we speak Arabic. Okay? Now, if we were to, I'm speaking in English now, Imam Shafi'i or Imam Malik were here, they'd be angry at me. But yani, th those were different times. And there's nothing wrong with uh, speaking another language, but they wanted to preserve uh, the language of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I say this as a non-Arab yes we should learn Arabic it's not wajib to learn Arabic uh, to understand it but subhanAllah this is our religion the Quran is our religion the Sunnah is our religion and learning Arabic is a big part of our religion you cannot become a true student of the Quran until you learn Arabic this is a simple fact you cannot become a student of the Quran until you learn Arabic and it it really irritates me sometimes when I hear somebody say, I have read 10 different translations of this verse, as if he's become now a great mufassir, when he's read 10 different English translations. Reading a translation is meaningless. You haven't, wallahi, you have not read the verse yet, much less the tafsir of the verse. You have not read the verse if you have to read the translation in order to understand, uh, in, uh, in order to understand uh, the Quran. So Allah says, I have revealed this kitab in mubin, in an Arabic language so that you can understand it. Now, if somebody were to say, it's not fair that the non-Arabs therefore don't understand the Quran. Allah is saying, I have revealed the Quran in Arabic in order that you understand. What do we do as a non-Arab? And what are non-Arabs supposed to do with the guidance in the Arabic language? The response to this is, one language had to have been chosen, logically, and even if Allah chose another language, then people of other languages would have said the same thing. So this is not a solid response to criticize its revelation in Arabic, number one. Number two, we say that Arabic is the most eloquent of all languages. And by the way, if you look at it, all of the languages that we know of that Allah revealed books in are Semitic languages. He revealed books in Hebrew, and He revealed books in Aramaic. And he probably revealed books in Syriac, the language of Dawud Islam. we don't know. But all of the languages that the books came down in are Semitic languages. Uh, Semitic is a family of languages, right? Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, Arabic, these are Semitic. And then you have the Indo-Aryan languages, and this is Latin, and from Latin we get, uh, Latin and Sanskrit are actually cousins. Uh, and then from Latin we get all of these Romance languages. It's a different family, completely. It has nothing to do with our branch of Arabic. Um, and if you study the differences between those two branches, you find a world of a difference. And those of you who are Arabs and have studied Nahu and Sarf back in your grade 2 and 3, right, once upon a time, uh, Nahu and Sarf is a blessing. I know you guys used to hate it, believe me, I didn't love it as well, but it's a blessing. Why? Because it shows you the structure of a language. The structure, the precision of Nahu and Sarf, I'm going into a tangent here, but you don't find it in English grammar. You don't find it in Latin grammar, especially the science of sarf, where you take a three-letter verb, a three-letter word, and you add an alif or wow or a noon, you add a meme, and the structure is set. From one word, you can derive 250 words. Once you learn one word in the Arabic language, one word, all you have to learn is one three-letter verb, one three-letter root. Instantaneously, you can derive 250 at least, if you know sarf properly. And this is an amazing, amazing uh, language. It doesn't exist in English, it doesn't exist in any other language. So Allah is saying, I revealed it in Arabic so that you may, so that you may understand it. 
Uh, and the third point we'll say with this, if a non-Arab says this, we say, even if you don't understand its full beauty in Arabic, a translation will give you a portion of that beauty. It will give you a glimpse of it. And so, non-Muslims, we give them the translation of the Qur'an. There's no problem whatsoever. Some more strict Muslims say we should not give them translations of the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ wrote to the Emperor of Rome. And in that letter, he wrote a verse of the Qur'an. And when the Emperor received the verse, it was translated in front of him. And this is the first time in history that the Qur'an was translated into Latin in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. How can anybody say this is not allowed? In the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, and he knows it's going to be translated. The emperor of Rome did not speak Arabic. And the Prophet wrote him in Arabic. And so it is our duty to translate the Quran into other languages. The Prophet had no problem doing it. It's not the Quran anymore, but the glimpse of beauty will remain. And therefore, the Quran will remain. But the other languages are permissible. Allah says after this. Uh, that we have sent this Qur'an down in uh, Qur'an and Arabi One of the reasons why Allah is beginning the surah Yes, why is Allah beginning the surah? By mentioning we have revealed this Qur'an to you One of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this Is to remind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Of the favors that he has upon him The favors that Allah has given him And this is a standard motif of the Qur'an your Lord has not left you, nor has He abandoned you. Didn't we find you as an orphan and we took care of you? Allah is reminding the favors that He has done to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And why does He do this? To re uh, this is human nature. That when you're down, what what do you need? You need somebody to cheer you up, right? When you're spiritually down. When you're going through a depression mode or something that's depressing, what happens? Somebody's what happens when your loved ones come? It's all right, you know, this, that. They cheer you up. They tell you something positive. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling the greatest positive thing. That we have revealed this Qur'an to you, anzannahu. One person. We have revealed this Qur'an to you. Thank Allah for this. This is the greatest blessing you can have. So we have revealed it in Arabic so that you may uh, understand it. The last verse that we'll do and then we'll open the floor for question and answer inshaAllah. نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص نحن نقص عليك نحن we have already mentioned that the plural occurs because of Allah and the angels نقص عليك we recite to you the stories what stories أحسن القصص the best of all stories now قصة what is a قصة قصة actually the word قصة comes from qassa and qassa means to follow the footsteps in the sta in the sand when you uh, the bedouins when they f when they found somebody's footsteps they would follow them in order to catch up to that person in order to get to that person and that's why allah says in the quran about uh, about um, musa alayhi salam fartadda ala atharihima qassasa there's no story involved here qassasa here means what Musa and Yusha, they followed their own qasasa. They followed their own footsteps back, right? Qasas here means to follow the footsteps till you meet the person. So why is a story come from following the footsteps? It's pretty obvious. Why? Somebody. Hmm? Something handed down, good attempt, close, not quite. You didn't quite get the prize. Stories are handed down. That's close, but even closer. The linkage of it. You will su no. I'm talking about why is a qissa called a qissa? Not for not. Pro I'm talking. About why is a story called a qissa? It's a linguistic question. Beginning and ending. Someone has to say it. <laughs> Told again, again, similar stuff, but we're not getting to it. <laughs> Chronological. What is a qissa? You are walking in their footsteps. Like, what does qassa mean? I said to walk in somebody's footsteps, to follow them. 
When I tell you the qissa, what happens to you? What happens to you? Any qissa, I'm talking about any qissa. Right? You're living it, exactly. That's, what was, that's exactly what I was looking for. You're living it, right? You're, you're, you are there. Why, why does everybody love a story? A story is mesmerizing. A, a person never grows too old to listen to a story, right? No matter how old you are, you love to listen to a story. What do we do to children to put them to sleep? We tell them a story. What do we do when the, 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 my kids come to me? I want a story. I want a story, right? This is what children love. Wallahi, all of us are children in this regard. We will love stories. And Allah is saying, we're going to give you the best of stories. So, Qissa is called a Qissa. Why? Because we are walking the walk. When we hear the story, it is as if we're following their footsteps. So, Allah is saying, we will give you the best of stories. And stories, by the way, subhanAllah, if you read any book of how to speak, how to give an effective talk, there's always a chapter dedicated to the story. In fact, in uh, one of the latest books I read, it said, always begin a lecture with a personal anecdote. Always. You begin with a personal story. Why? Because it grabs the attention of the audience. Right? So it's human nature that stories are attractive. Stories are something you like to listen to, number one. Number two, stories, those lessons in them are manifested. Now, for example, if I open up, uh, if I open up Riyadh al-Salihin and I tell you the benefits of Patience, mashallah, good. But now I get to the story of the mother of Anas, right? And how she reacted when her son died, right? Now those ahadith, they are brought home. It's not the same as just saying, whoever is patient, mashallah, he has good iman. Okay, good. But when I show you a story, those stories, they remain with you. Those stories, you are affected by them more. It's human nature. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us stories. Another benefit of a story, a story is aqidah in action, theology in action. It's one thing to say we believe in Allah. It's one thing to say we put my trust in Allah. When we hear the story of Ibrahim and he's going to be thrown into the fire and he puts his trust in Allah, what is this? Theology shown in action. Right? So aqidah is manifested. Another benefit of the story is it's the reality of what has happened in the past. It's a real thing, it's not theory anymore. We know this happened to the previous prophets and so we sense it more. And yet another benefit is that stories, they teach us that Allah's sunnah is repetitive. What has happened in the past will happen again. What is the purpose of a fable, a story that we tell our children? Why do we tell it? There's always a moral to the story, right? There's always a lesson to be learned. And the lessons of Allah, these, these rules of Allah are permanent. And when we hear these stories, we are reinforced. These rules are reinforced. So we're, we're going to come to this. One of the fundamental rules of the story of Yusuf is righteousness will win out in the end. Evil can never succeed in the long run. This is one of the main themes of Surah Yusuf. We're going to come to this. Now, when we read the story, we see this manifested. We see it in real life. And therefore, this maxim, this rule, is then implanted in us. That righteousness will win out in the end. And that is why Allah says in the Quran, that we are going to send you down stories, لِنُثَبِّتَ bihi fu'adak To strengthen your resolve. It's not childish to find motivation in stories. It is imanic. It's part of our iman. And that is why reading the stories of the Prophets, reading the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is one of the greatest ways to increase Iman. Reading the, the, the stories of the Sahaba brings about a sense of taqwa and Iman, of, of shuja, of courage in us. So stories are a part of the Qur'an and Sunnah, they're a part of human nature. And this whole surah is a story. We will be narrating to you the best of all stories. This has two meanings to it. Number one, Every single Qur'anic story is the best of its kind. Every story in the Qur'an is the best. And this is for many, many reasons. Number one, because they're all true. This, the Qur'an is not legends and fables, right? And a true story is always better than an imaginary story. Number two, that they have the best morals. No other story will give you those types of morals. Number three, the eloquent manners of presenting these stories. There is no story that can be more eloquent than the Qur'anic one. Number four, that every story that a man writes, 
will have details and information that is not needed and it distracts from the story. Details that are distracting from the moral. Allah Azza wa Jal will tell you exactly what you need to know and not more and not less. So the point is given and this is one of the biggest differences between the story of Yusuf in the Quran versus the story of Yusuf in the Old Testament. The Old Testament gives you so many details you get lost. Whereas the story of Yusuf, even a 10 year old can read it, cover to cover, understand everything. Because the details are not there that will get you to cause, uh, to cause you to become lost. So we, were, so we said the first meaning, every story in the Quran is the best. A second meaning that has been derived, the fact that Allah mentions this verse in Surah Yusuf is an indication that Surah Yusuf is what? The best of all stories. So there's two meanings we derive. Number one, Quranic stories are better than all non-Quranic stories. That's pretty obvious. And the Quran re-emphasizes this. Number two, the story of Yusuf is the best of all of these stories. That's an indication. That's why Allah begins this surah with نَحْنُ قُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We are the one who will tell you the best of all uh, qasas. بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ بِمَا means like uh, basically uh, because or, or uh, because we have or through this revelation that we have given to you هذا Quran. So in other words, because we are revealing the Quran to you, it is our duty to tell you the best of all stories. هذا Quran, this Quran, even though before the Quran came down, you were from the غافلين. What does غافل mean? غافل means you didn't have knowledge. غفلة means to not have knowledge. And sometimes that ghafla is intentional and sometimes it is unintentional. And in this case, it is unintentional. The Prophet ﷺ did not have access to knowledge. So Allah calls our Prophet ﷺ ghafil because he didn't have the knowledge. Not because he didn't uh, study, but because he could not have studied. So Allah is saying that because we have revealed this Qur'an to you, it is our right to give you the best of all stories. Because we have revealed the Qur'an, it is our duty to give you the best of all stories. Pause here. Allah calls the book Quran. One verse ago, He called it what? Kitab. What did we say? Kitab and Quran are complementary. The Kitab is written, the Quran is recited. And the two put together form the reality of our book. Kitab and Quran. And Allah mentions both in the, in the beginning of this surah. So we have revealed to you uh, the best of all uh, stories because of our relation to the Quran. وَإِن كُنْتَ Even though مِنْ قَبْلِهِ Before the Qur'an came down, you were from the غَافِلِينَ Now this shows us a number of points. And with this, inshallah, we will conclude and open the floor for Q&A. Number one, the Prophet wasallam, despite being the greatest human being, before the wahi came down, he did not know these details. Now what does that show? This is a very profound point for modern philosophers, scientists and whatnot, especially for philosophers. The Quran is the ultimate source of all of our guidance. We will never know ultimate truth from falsehood, good from evil without the Quran. A lot of people, and it's the modern philosophy is based on this, think that if you sit in a cave and meditate, I'm being a bit sarcastic here, but if you just use your intellect, you will be able to derive all the wisdoms you need to know. You'll be able to figure out what's right and wrong, what's the best way to govern, what's the best way to judge, what's the best ruling, what's this and that. The Quran tells us no. Even before the Quran came down, you, despite being the best of all human beings, were ghafil. If our Rasul could not know all of these truths before the Quran came down, do you think that me or you or Tom or Dick or Harry or this philosopher or that doctor or this uh, engineer or that philosopher will ever know the realities? Will they be more than our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Allah says in the Quran, مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ You didn't used to know what was Iman, what was the book. You didn't used to know. Allah says in the Quran, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى The meaning of dal here is not misguided. The Prophet was never misguided. Dal means you weren't on the path. So you could be misguided or you just don't have a path. In the case of the Prophet he did not have that path yet. 
So if this was the state of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the Wahi came down, before the revelation came down, what then is the state of other than the Rasul without Wahi? There is no guidance without the Quran. This is a fundamental belief of all Muslims. And that's why the Quran is a hidayah, and that's why the Quran is Salat al Mustaqim, and that's why the Quran is Kitab in Mubin, Kitab in Hakim. You will never be able to achieve ultimate truths without the Quran. So Allah says, even though before this, before the coming of the revelation, you were from the uh, Ghafilin. And uh, one last point that we benefit from here is that Allah is saying, You didn't know these surahs before I revealed them to you, you were Ghafil about them. So, how did you know about them? And we mentioned this before. How did you living in Mecca without access to any library, without any Old or New Testament, without access to Jews and Christians, how did you know about the story of Yusuf? There's only one source and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is of the greatest miracles that we as Muslims many times neglect and don't appreciate. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is living in an environment of complete illiteracy, complete ignorance. There are no libraries, there's no universities, there's no scholars. The people in Mecca were Bedouins. Imagine in our times, imagine in our times, now with the internet and cell phones, this is difficult to imagine, right? For those of you who are older than 15, 20, you remember a time when there was no internet and cell phone, right? Imagine in that era, you come across a tribe in Brazil or the jungles of Africa, completely cut off from civilization. And they have amongst them a man who's talking about the histories of Rome and Persia. He's talking about the stories of the Old and New Testament. He's a complete in the middle of the jungle. The people can't even read and write. They're literally backward uh, tribesmen, let's say. But they have a man amongst them who knows all of these things. Isn't this something we cannot imagine? It's a miracle of miracles, right? This was the case of our Prophet Sallallahu in Mecca. He's coming forth with stories, issues, statements people had no access to. The only access could have been from Allah. And this is one of the clear signs that uh, the, the Quran is indeed from Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. La yazal al khayr hayya la yazal inna fi al dunya salaman wa zilal akhbir al ayyam anna fi wisal qum bina wa nzur li ayat al jamal qum bina wa nzur li ayat al jamal